good evening, everyone. Um, Sarah left me some, there it is, okay. It's good to see everyone tonight, and uh, we're going to talk about Obadiah tonight. We're going to finish out our series, Who Were Those Guys? Uh, Brother Gossett was going to be uh, presenting this lesson, so if he had some specific things in mind, you're going to miss him. We'll have to wait till he comes around again. But um, as you all all know, he's there out of state. Uh, they're up with their uh, son and his family uh, in, I always say Nebraska, but it is Nebraska. Okay. For a reason, I keep thinking they're in Kansas and not Nebraska, but they're in Nebraska. Uh, I do know that. Um, <laughs> not much of a difference, but yes, good point. But before we get into our lesson, I wanted to take us, us to take a moment and pray for the gossips, for Sam particularly, and for his family, uh, but also for Skylar. Um, those of you, you all who've known Katie and her children, Skylar's her daughter, and she's going into surgery in the morning uh, to get a tube inserted in her ears. And so I think it's all planned, and the doctors are confident, but for a little one, that's scary, and for mom, that's scary. So why don't we take a moment and pray for Sam and pray for Skylar uh, that God would undertake on both of their behalf. Lord, we bring Sam to you tonight, God. I'm so thankful for good news I'm so thankful that things seem to be on the mend, but I ask, Lord, that you undertake, that your arm reaches and you can do what we can't do. You understand what we don't understand. You're able to heal to the uttermost, God, and that's what I pray for Sam, healing to the uttermost, Jesus. Be with their family, God, in the midst of all of this. Give them peace, Jesus. Let your spirit and your presence be there. Lord, put your hand on Skylar as she goes into surgery tomorrow. Be with her, be with her mom, God. Help her to have peace. Hallelujah. In the midst of frightening circumstances, guide the hands of the doctors, of the surgeon, Jesus, that everything would be done well and with excellence, Lord. And above all, God, undertake and be with them, Lord. We love you, Lord, and we praise your name. Thank you, Jesus. Well, as is our tradition for this series, we're going to start with uh, a quick overview of the book. So, Landon, if you can pull that up, it should just be an easy worship. You can double click it and go. Yeah, the video. The book of the prophet Obadiah. This is the shortest book in the whole Old Testament. It's a mere 21 verses. And at first glance, it does not look very promising. It's a series of divine judgment poems against the ancient people of Edom, which was a nation that neighbored Israel on the other side of the Dead Sea. However, there is way, way more going on here. So first, here's the backstory. The people of Edom were unique because they had a shared ancestry with the Israelites. They both belonged to the family of Abraham, who with Sarah had their son Isaac, who with his wife Rebecca had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Now the book of Genesis told us the story of these two brothers and to say the very least, they had a tense relationship. They each later received the names Israel and Edom, which eventually became the name of the families that descended from them. And these families replayed the same difficult relationship of their ancestors. Israel and Edom had enormous tensions throughout the centuries, but they still shared that family bond. And it's that bond that was betrayed and shattered in the tragic events of Jerusalem's fall to Babylon. So when Israel was invaded and conquered by Babylon, the people of Edom took advantage by plundering other Israelite cities and then capturing and even killing Israelite refugees. Now in other prophetic books, God held Israel's neighbors accountable for this kind of violence. And so here, Obadiah does the same for Edom. The short book has two halves. The first part is a series of accusations against the leaders of Edom, specifically for their pride and self-exaltation. Literally, as they lived up high in the desert rocks, but also metaphorically, they truly believed they were superior to the Israelites. And it's that pride that led the Edomites to not just stand idly by when Babylon came to destroy Jerusalem, but actually to participate in the destruction. And so God says through Obadiah that Edom will be brought down from their height and destroyed. As they have done to Israel, so it will be done to them. Now, right when you think you're going to hear more about how Edom will meet its doom, the topic suddenly shifts in verse 15. We hear this, the day of the Lord is near against all nations. 
Now, why do we all of a sudden shift from Edom now to all nations? This first is a hinge piece, and it links the first half of the book to the second half, where Obadiah announces the day of the Lord, but not only for Edom. He widens his focus to include all nations. And Obadiah says that all prideful nations that act like Edom will face God's justice in the same way. They'll fall from their prideful heights and come to ruin. Now the combination of these two sections, one about Edom, the other about all nations, shows us why Obadiah was so interested in this tiny southern neighbor of Israel. Obadiah sees Edom's pride and fall as an example, an image, of how God will one day confront the pride of all nations and bring about their fall too. It's hardly coincidental that in Hebrew the word Edom, or Edom, is spelled with the exact same letters as the word humanity, or in Hebrew, Adam. In Obadiah, Edom's rise and fall is a parable of how God's justice will one day oppose pride and violence among all nations in the day of the Lord. But as in all the prophets, God's judgment is never his final word. Specifically, remember the conclusion of the two books that came right before Obadiah, Joel and Amos. Joel had painted a picture of what will happen after the day of the Lord against all nations. He said that God would perform a new act of salvation in Jerusalem and that all who humbled themselves and called upon him would be delivered. And in the conclusion of Amos, he said that after the day of the Lord has judged Israel's evil, God would raise up the house of David and build a new kingdom for Israel that would include Edom and all the nations called by my name. And so the book of Obadiah has been placed right after Joel and then Amos to expand on these very promises about the hope of God's kingdom over all of the nations. And so the book concludes with a very hopeful future. God says he's going to restore his kingdom over the new Jerusalem, that he'll repopulate it with a faithful remnant. And then from there, God's kingdom will expand to include all the territory and nations around Israel. And so this little book contributes to the larger portrait of God's justice and faithfulness that we're seeing in the prophets. The ancient pride and betrayal of the people of Edom becomes an example of the greater human condition, all of the ways that we betray and hurt each other in God's good world. But there's hope, Obadiah says. Edom's downfall points to the day when God will deal with evil in our world, but also bring his healing kingdom of peace over all the nations. And that's what the book of Obadiah is all about. All right, you're dismissed. Just kidding. <laughs> that's a wonderful summary of Obadiah. Um, and because Obadiah is so short, actually we have the advantage tonight, I think we can read the book. Um, now I'll give you two options. I can read it or if I have volunteers we can ping pong it back so you're not listening to me the whole time. Do I have any volunteers to read? All right, I've got some. Well, then let's go to Obadiah, and I have it in the ESV. Land, if you can pull up Obadiah, uh, starting at verse 1, and we'll read maybe um, the first four verses, and then we'll switch off uh, every couple verses. Uh, uh, David, do you want to start us out, and then Brittany, I'll switch over to you. Brittany, do you want to pick up verse 5? If someone else wants to pick up in verse 10, Sarah, maybe through verse 14.
apparently these are all things that uh, Edom did, contrary to the instruction of the Lord through Obadiah. Before we finish out the book, let me give you some context. Uh, Landon, can you pull up the map and just show us where Edom was? So blue is the kingdom of Israel. Red is the kingdom of Judah. You have the Philistines to the west in what's now Gaza. You have the Moabites to the east of Judah in the kingdom of Moab. And then that yellow underneath is Edom. So this is the area that is being discussed. And um, Landon, go to the, um, I have three pictures there I want to show you. I think I have them in the order I want them. This is the kind of uh, landscape that we're talking about in this portion of the world. This is the, the rocks that they were making their dwellings in, the high places that, that they felt they were unassailable. They couldn't be reached. Uh, go to the next picture. You might imagine dwellings like this, which we can still see today. And then there's one more, which is stunning. Are you all familiar with this? This is the treasury at Petra, which was the capital of Edom. The joke here, though, is this was not built by the Edomites. This uh, comes after them. This was built by those who conquered them, who overthrew them, and utterly wiped them out. The prophecy that the Lord uh, gave through Obadiah came true to the point where there are no living Edomites that we know of today. Um, there are no descendants of the kingdom of Esau, of Edom. But I wanted to give you that picture. This is, it gives you a little bit of a different flavor when you hear the Lord saying things like, you know, though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set upon the stars, I will bring you down. It's almost like the Lord saying, yes, you have attained. Yes, you're right. You are unassailable. There's a little bit of irony there in that it's kind of like, well, but why would anybody want to assail you? You, you have nothing. You have rocks. You're a kingdom that doesn't produce much. You have no real outside trade. Judah was a long time your friend and neighbor because they were one of the few that were your friends and neighbors. But, but who would, but despite you saying, yes, I am so unassailable, not only, you know, it's almost the prophet's, poking at them a bit. If it was just thieves, they'd only take what they need. If it was people coming to harvest all your crops, at least there'd be some stuff left over from them gleaning. But uh, you've been completely emptied out. And that was the case, of course, with Edom. Let's pick up and read, um, continuing in verse 15, if someone has the verse and go through maybe verse 18. David? I'll finish it out here. Verse 19, those of the Negev shall possess Mount Esau. Those of the Shephelah shall possess the land of the Philistines. They shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. The exiles of this host of the people of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad shall possess the cities of the Negev. Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Now, before I, I get into a little bit more, um, again, the Bible Project does such a good job of kind of explaining the big picture, but there's a couple other interesting things I think we can, we can look at in detail that they didn't quite get to. But before that, who knows um, who Obadiah is? Other than his prophecy, who knows anything about him from the Bible? beyond the prophecy? Well, trick question, because I was going to ask, have you instruct me? No, we don't know. This is all we know of Obadiah. We have no other information about him. Um, and as the Bible project laid out, we believe this was written 
and sometime in five to six hundred BC, uh, probably or, or maybe late six hundred BC. Uh, you have to remember that BC goes backwards, right? Larger dates are earlier, and smaller dates are. But that's not where. It's also possible this was written sometime in eight hundred BC. Um, some scholars think that the uh, attack on Jacob is talking about the Philistine and Arabian uh, invasions of eight forty one BC. Uh, but most people believe it was five, talking about the 586 invasion of Babylon. Right? So this would be when Judah was dispossessed of their land, when they were scattered out of their inheritance. Um, and as the Bible Project pointed out, uh, other places of Scripture point to the behavior of Edom towards Judah in that time. Uh, they had this bond with them as brethren, as kin that were not always friendly, but usually on good terms, but when the final judgment fell and Judah was taken from their land, Edom offered no help, but quite the opposite. They were uh, piled on with the enemies of, of Judah. And as I was reading for tonight and studying for tonight, uh, this really, this isn't the first time I've read Obadiah, but uh, it's the first time I've really sat and thought with it for a while. And I don't know if it's just because, I don't think it's an accident, it's very topical uh, <laughs> to be touching on this book. Um, and I can't help but think of recent world events, the current trouble that is facing Israel. Before I touch on that, let's look again at verses, um, verses 19 through 21. If you notice this, this reads, there, there's a parallel, I don't know if anyone else sees this, to Joshua. This is very much like the last books of Joshua where Joshua is saying, and this tribe is going to inherit this part of the land, and this tribe is going to inherit this part of the land. This is like a reparceling out of the land that was promised to Israel. So you have here at the tail end of this a promise to God's people that they are going to retake what was originally part of the promised land that he gave to Israel. And uh, I should have looked at it now, but if you look at a map now, a good portion of the uh, land that was Edom is currently owned by Israel. So in a very real sense, that has happened. That's come to pass. It's also interesting the, the names that they use uh, because he talks about the exiles. It seems like Obadiah is talking about exiles not just from Jerusalem, but even from uh, Israel. We traditionally don't really think of Israel having any survivors, but there were exiled Jews from Israel that made their way uh, back to uh, some semblance of, of a relationship. And uh, it seems like Obadiah is even making a promise for them here as well. It's interesting, too, uh, that, city, that city named in verse 20, the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad. Uh, we, don't ha we have no idea where that city actually is, but many scholars think this is not local to the area but this is somewhere as far as some believe it's even a city in, in what we would call Spain today. So already at this point, there have been Jews that have been scattered and exiled well beyond the borders of Palestine of that area. Um, and so Obadiah here is prophesying something that we, that no one, we didn't see the fulfillment of until this last millennium, this, you know, this, this 1900s, right? Um, but, so, thinking about that, that last verse, let me touch on that one, and then I'll, I'll try and collect my thoughts for what kind of settled with me as I was preparing for tonight. That last verse, Savior shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau. The kingdom shall be the Lord's. This is interesting as well, uh, especially when you kind of parallel it with Joshua. What happened? You had Joshua, you had the, the actual uh, conquering of the promised land by the children of Israel under the command of Joshua. You had the driving out of the inhabitants to some degree. You had the, the distribution of the land as promised to the tribes. And then what followed that? What book is right after Joshua? Judges. After Joshua, you have the time of the judges. And, of course, the 
uh, main phrase that's so often repeated in Judges is, at that time there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. And so in a very real sense, you can see Judges as this, um, it's almost like you get to the end of Judges, and the answer is, well, Israel needs a strong leader. They need a king, not just a judge who's going to rise up and fade away, but and in fact, they ask for a king, and God grants them that. And, and that's not entirely a bad thing. Through, through the kingdom of Israel, you get David. You get the messianic line. You get um, this beautiful, you know, prophetic uh, imagery. I was very tempted to go in, into depth, but it's not about Obadiah. But, you know, in a very real sense, when you think about the Jewish perspective of the kingship, the king was, uh, in some places, referred to as the son of God, Elohim, the one who was appointed by God. So the king was seen in Jewish minds as in the right hand of God. He was God's man on earth executing his will uh, to, to lead his people, which puts a different perspective when you hear Jesus being described as being on the right hand of God. It very much is this Davidic succession. He is the, the will of the Lord on earth, which we understand in hindsight much clearer than they did then. But if you look at this, so Obadiah is written clearly after the, the establishment of the kingship. Most likely Obadiah is written at the very end, the complete utter failure of the line of the kings of Israel and of Judah. Um, and his final word about this is that saviors shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau. And that word saviors and that word rule uh, in the original Hebrew, they're reminiscent of the words used for, like, Joshua, for Moses. Saviors like Joshua. And rule is the same word that's used in Judges for judge. So it's interesting that in a very real sense, what he's saying is that the people that are going to be leading this are not the king. The kingdom is the Lord's. So it's this... Uh, these last two verses have such a beautiful parallel, almost bringing you back to God as the king. God is the one who's literally on the throne. And as the Bible Project so wonderfully put, in a very real sense, Obadiah is contrasting the judgment of God with the hope for a world after the judgment of God that is ordered well, that is being led by God, that he's the one who's the king. He's the one who is... Uh, on the throne, and we, the thought there is this kind of uh, betrayal, this kind of uh, injustice won't be perpetrated anymore because God is king. So as I was, I was studying for tonight, and Brother Goss will have to come and, and poke me if I missed anything that he was really wanting to touch on, but I spent a lot of time looking at this and, oh, come on, oh, my notes just disappeared. Thank you. Well, we'll do it without the notes. I was reading some of the commentaries of Obadiah, and one of the things that came up to be very interesting was the concept of forgiveness. Because from a Jewish perspective, what Edom did was unforgivable. The, the judgment of God in Obadiah is very severe, as it is in, in many of these other prophetic books. As Brother Gossett mentioned, we were, you know, we were maybe originally going to call this the prophets of doom, and we thought, well, that's a bit more negative than we want to be. We'll talk, you know, who are these minor prophet guys? But when you look at each of these prophets, their, their prophecies center around the judgment. And as we've seen, every one of them has a promise following the judgment. But one of the things that continues to come so clear to me, and Obadiah is an excellent, excellent example is that God is a just God. God does see the oppression of his people. God does see the oppression of those who are downtrodden. And uh, as, as was mentioned, in a very real sense, the, you know, if we go back and look at, I think it's verse 4 and verse 5, in the description of, um, of Edom, or sorry, yeah, it's verse, verse 3 and verse 4, this description, the pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rocks, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, who will bring me to the ground? And 
there was a commentator here who brought up this idea of forgiveness. Who deserves forgiveness? Because clearly, Edom here deserves judgment, and that's what God has brought. Jewish perspective of forgiveness is very different than the, the Christian perspective of forgiveness. In that the Jewish perspective for forgiveness is that the only person who can forgive you is the person that you have wronged. So from a Jewish perspective, murder is the highest sin because you cannot be forgiven for murder because you have murdered the one who could forgive you. And so there is no, that's why the traditional Jewish perspective, of course, opinions are varied, but the traditional Jewish perspective even today is that the only acceptable recourse for murder is death because there is no possible path of forgiveness. Whereas the Christian perspective looks at things a bit differently. And ultimately, God is able to forgive. And, and, of course, a modern understanding of forgiveness, even from the world, is different still. Right? We forgive for our sake. But it loses some of this. I think it's one of the things that has struck, my wife and I have talked about this a lot, it's one of the things that struck me so much about what's currently going on in Israel. And I don't know how much of the news you've kept up with, and I'm not, I don't want to bring us all down. But it's a reminder that Evil exists. Real evil exists. And how unjust to just ignore it or to pretend like it's not a problem or to pretend like it shouldn't be dealt with. Now, as a, as a Christian, I feel like my calling is to seek and to save like Jesus. It's my calling to go out into the world and try and reach people with the gospel, the good news, no matter who they are. But I can't get away from this fact that God cares. He's not just on the, on the side. This led me to um, a, an account by a Holocaust survivor. And I'd read through it. And one of the things he said is, it seems like God is on vacation. He's taking a leave of absence because how could he allow these things to happen to us if he was there? And the book doesn't have a really strong conclusion. His conclusion is, uh, some of you might have read it. It's called The Sunflower. It's not a long book. His conclusion, he, he's dealing with this circumstance where um, a Nazi SS soldier on his deathbed has him attend and listens to his confession. And he believes that this man is truly, genuinely sorry for what he's done. That he was in Hitler's youth as a, as a young man, and, and, but he was a Christian before that. And now that he's on the other side of some of the things he's done, he's, he wishes he could go back. And he regrets deeply his life. And he asks the author to forgive him for what he's done because the author is a Jew. And the author's response is to be silent. He, he can't bring himself to say anything. And that decision haunts him for a long time after. His conclusion as the book is, well, what, what would you have done if you were in my shoes? What would you have done? Sitting in the presence of, of, of a man who confesses to things that you've personally witnessed against your people asking you for forgiveness, what would you have done? And so I don't know that I have a really deep, I think more than anything I'm struggling with this myself, and you're hearing that in my presentation of Obadiah. But in Obadiah, I think we see clearly this I don't want to say hatred because I don't think God hates anyone. But he resists the proud. And I don't think sometimes we, we patty cake that. You know, like, well, if you're arrogant, God's not going to help you. But no, if you're arrogant, he's actively resisting you. And what you have to recognize is that human pride doesn't end with just, oh, I'm better than the people next to me, and therefore I deserve the promotion. Or I'm going to be rude to my waiter because she's not really worth my attention because, you know, she's just a waiter. And, or, you know, well, I'm not going to listen to my colleague because he's not very intelligent and I'm better. Like, it's not, human pride ultimately is not a safe thing. Human pride ultimately leads to Edom. It leads to this, this nation that sees their brothers being demolished and joins in because, well, they knew this was coming. We've always been better than them. Human pride leads to, and that was what struck me so much about that account uh, of the 
the survivor there, it leads to this feeling of, well, they deserve it. They're other. We're better. And God resists the proud. Human pride leads to the Holocaust. Human pride leads to Edom. And God's response to Edom is judgment. And in that, there is the promise of peace and of hope. There is still a kingdom that shall be the Lord's. And as we've seen through all the prophets, there is always a remnant that's preserved. There's always a people that God is reaching for. And I don't think it's just, uh, you know, this line or that line. The people that God is reaching for are those who will respond, those who will find that place of repentance, those who will follow after the name of the Lord. And so, I don't know if it's comforting, um, but, and I, like I said, I'm still trying to figure out how to communicate this myself. There's a thought here that I feel in my spirit, but I don't know how to put into English. Um, I am very, very thankful for the mercy of God. I'm extremely grateful for his grace, for his long-suffering, for his patience, for all the things that he teaches us to be. But, and I don't entirely know how to reconcile these because I don't feel like I have any right to stand in a place of judgment. I don't feel like I have any right to stand in a place uh, to, to stand over anyone. My only response can be to extend grace and mercy because that was what was given to me. But I have to remind myself that he does have the right to stand in a place of judgment. He does have the right to look at the actions of everyone, to judge what we do, what we think, what we say, how we conduct ourselves. And he will, there will be a day of the Lord, which is both wonderful and terrible. Because on that day, the judge is returning. The one who will hold to account all those who have been prideful and boasted and lifted themselves up and said, who will, who will bring me low like Edom? Or like the Nazis, oh, you, you are going to, I'm going to stand before God in judgment? Fine, I'm happy to stand before God in judgment. There is no God. Except that day of the Lord will not be, that will not be the comforting thing to have said. But at the same time, that day of the Lord is the time where he puts things right. Where the things that we currently see going on and we wonder, Lord, why? Are you on vacation? Are you not here? Do you not care? Why would you allow our brothers to come and plunder us when we're in the middle of being destroyed by Babylon? Do you not care about your people? This will be the day that that will also be answered and we'll see the kingdom of God enacted in full. His will done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for that now. We will see it then. So as we finish out this this book of, of Obadiah, our minor prophets, I hope this has given you stuff, something to think about at least, um, and hopefully it's something to think about and hope. But it is, uh, like I said, it's something I still struggle to really explain, this, this mixture of reverent fear and incredible gratefulness and yearning yearning for the day of the Lord. It's such a, a terrible and wonderful, and yet my response is, even so, Lord, come quickly. Even so, Lord, let it come sooner. I trust you with the timing. I trust you with all of it, but I just want to see your will done. And until that time, I'm going to make myself humble. I'm going to put myself in a place low. Lord, you put me where you want me. If it's my concern, I'm going to put myself really low. I'm not going to be high. Because I don't want you to bring me low. I want you to lift me up. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attentiveness throughout these minor prophets. I hope it's given us something to, to take with us. Why don't we close in prayer and we'll dismiss from here. Lord, I am so thankful. I'm so thankful that we're not contending with all of this alone but that we have your presence, God. We have your spirit to speak to us, to work in us. Help us to have a heart like your heart, Lord. Help us to be 
angered by the things that you're angered and yet have the compassion that you have, Lord. Work in us, Lord, that we might be like you. We love you and we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.